What can't women do? Astronomer, Pinkerton detective, automobile driver, computer programmer. Good afternoon, I'm Joel Franklin, and welcome to today's JLG webinar series, Women Who Rock, Celebrating the Past and the Present. Women continue to rock our world through their talents, leadership, and their wisdom. From hot new biographies to strong female characters, writers, and illustrators, today's quick book talk is sure to lengthen your shopping cart list. Today, our resident library coach, Deborah B. Ford, will give you practical ideas for programming and services, resources, and strategies you can use to extend National Women's History Month into a year-long celebration. And you can join our conversation on Twitter. You can tweet us at JR Library Guild and use the hashtag JLGWebinars. You can also tweet out to Deborah right from the webinar console. If you have any questions or comments, you can send those in at any time via the red Q&A box. Last month, we heard about hidden figures, the computer ladies of NASA, and but we know women worked with math far earlier than that, right, Deborah? Absolutely. 200 years ago, Ada Lovelace was born to the poet Lord Byron and his wife, who just happened to be a mathematician. So I suppose the apple didn't far too fall from the tree. And so Ada right away was all involved in math, and she started working for her brother, and she ended up with Charles Babbage. Now, Charles Babbage was an inventor and a mathematician, and he knew how to create a computer, but he didn't know how to program the thing. And so it ended up that Ada became his programmer. And so 200 years ago, our first computer programmer was a woman. So yay for women. Um, you'll also find that Ada Lovelace, Poet of Science, has been featured by the blog, the Classroom Bookshelf, which is at slj.com. It's a great book for using for STEAM in your library programs and also for coding, which we're going to talk about coding a little bit later on in today's webcast. Um, and it is National Women's History Month. Um, Women's History Month, you'd think, would have started a long time ago, but actually we didn't get a, a, a time to celebrate National Women's History Month. The first thing that happened was National Women's History Week, which finally was passed in 1982, but it wasn't until 1987 that we actually got a celebratory month. And just like we talked about last month with diversity, we want to continue to celebrate women not just in March, just like we don't celebrate poetry just in April, but certainly a focus that we've been doing this month wherever you've looked. We've been looking at um, ways you can celebrate Women's History Month, this month especially. Um, so today we're going to talk about not only why we celebrate Women's History Month, but we're going to look at some great books. We're going to look at some programs and services. I've got a few websites I want to share with you and some other online free, yay we love free, resources. So let's look at another book that you might share with your readers. This one is Trudy's Big Swim, and it's a story of how Gertrude swam 20, I want to say 21 miles. The number escapes me right this second. But she was the first female to cross the English Channel, Ta-da! and she was the sixth to actually complete the whole swim. I can't even swim across a swimming pool. I can't imagine swimming miles and miles and miles, and even in the dark with jellyfish, with sharks, um, eating from a fishing basket um, while she treads water. I mean, it was a team effort, and she made it. Um, it's interesting, too, that because of when she did this, the bathing attire was, of course, um, very different. People were wearing long bloomers and things, and women didn't cover them. You know, they covered themselves all, all up. So even Trudy's swimwear was, um, I guess, radical, I guess we could call it. And one really cool thing I learned from this book is that Trudy's celebratory um, efforts were first recognized in the first ticker tape parade in New York City. And so it was the first time they'd ever done anything like that. And so Trudy was the first person that they recognized um, here's your homework. Who was the second one? If you find the answer, tweet it out, and I'll send you a Librarian's Rock sticker. Now, as I'm reading these books, as my mom says, I write book reports for a living. So after I read the books, I look for 
all kinds of resources to go with them so that you, as you teach your story hours or you do your library programming um, or you're teaching research in your school library, you don't have to find all those resources alone. So where can you go? You can go to bit.ly slash JLG Live Binders. And there you'll see all kinds of live binders. We do one for every catalog that we have. So right now we're in spring 2017. So all the books that I'm talking about today, you'll find in our spring live binder. So let me show you that. So for example, here we have um, a close-up look at our spring 2017 live binder. And you see here's Trudy. Trudy's Big Swim, and here you see our book talk to go. And then on the right hand side, you will see all the, um, you'll see the book detail page like you would see if you were at JLG. And you'll also see the book talks to go. So remember now that our marketing team, yay, thanks guys, is putting um, the link to the book talk to go within the book detail page. So if you want to know if it has all the resources, you can see it while you're at Junior Library Guild. Um, and let's cross talk this book too. Um, if you are, if you like this book, then you can go a little further and you can see some other books you might like. And then um, here are more books by the author. For example, Sue Macy. I was just talking about Sue. She had a radio interview today, and so I'll be adding that. Um, after we get off the phone. Uh, but here in gray, you see all the resources that you could use to teach the book. So you'll see the New York Times article about the ticker tape parade. You'll see, oh, here's one right here. You can go to read more about um, Gertrude, which is her whole name, um, if you go to biography.com. And then, of course, you want to check out the authors and the illustrators' websites as well. As we look at some more books, let's talk about Kate Warren. Kate Warren, in 1856, decided that she needed a new job. She had herself to support and no man to do it, and so she decided to answer an ad for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And that ad didn't ask for any women. And did she care? No. She went anyway, and she convinced the Pinkerton detectives to hire her. And so she went in um, undercover because she's, you know, their first objections were, oh, but a woman couldn't do this. It's dangerous. And a woman couldn't do that, blah, blah, blah. And so she said, yes, but a woman could go to places where a man can't go. And so her first case was a great success, and she became one of their best detectives. Um, when you read this book, you'll see a little bit about a history of the agency. And then in the curriculum guide, um, you'll get all kinds of activities for how to celebrate this book with your readers. And you'll find that in the live binders for more resources. Another resource that you um, have access to is, of course, the National Women's History Museum. And there in the Women's History Museum, I found some great posters. So here's a thing where you can add the posters to your classroom or your library so kids can get some ideas about people they might want to learn more about or do some research about. They have lesson plans there. There are book discussions. There are videos that you can show. One of the things um, that we often run into, whether you're a public or a school librarian, is that kids get an assignment to do a biography report. How many of you have that? Uh-huh, and sometimes those reports are, the book has to be X number of pages. And most of the time, the pages are not as long as we might need them to be. So, for example, um, here is Motor Girls by Sue Macy. Um, the biography is all about girls who were involved in the early automobile industry, and girls who drove cars, and girls who drove across the country, and how they were involved in that. But the biography is 96 pages long. And so what might you do instead? You might do real research, just like Sue did. And you'll go out, and you'll use your databases, and you might have your kids read more than one book. Um, and uh, you can also do some supportive online materials. There are a couple of, if you go back to the live binders, you'll see them. There are articles from a company called Newzella, and they have a 
free informational text where you can change the Lexile just with a click of a button. And so you can go from third grade to ninth grade right there on the website. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica does a similar kind of thing. Twain Tribune that is owned by the Smithsonian will also let you adjust Lexiles and both Newzella and Twain Tribune also let you change from English to Spanish in many cases. But then your kids could do some research. So you get them interested in some of the girls who show up in Motor Girls and then have them do more research um, like they would if they were a real writer. Uh, now, if you're a librarian and you get this assignment on the back end, maybe you're at a public library and you didn't even know it was coming. So one thing that you could do is you want to be proactive. And so maybe you create some sort of tutorial, a screencast, or you make a pamphlet or something where you talk about um, don't have a 100-page biography or report. Here are some things you can do instead. So you could do the same kind of things that I'm, I'm talking about. And there are resources for that in the Live Binder. Um, you'll love Motor Girls. It's great information for our middle grade readers and if I were you, I would probably get it for my fifth and sixth graders as well as my high schoolers, too, um, because it's great information about the automobile industry and what people thought and how they used the, the girls who drove these cars as um, advertising models, things that happened as a result. It talks about some of the cross-country trips that were made and the marketing attempts, I mean, the marketing campaigns that um, occurred as a result of these um, promotional activities. So I think you'll enjoy the Motor Girls. And there's lots of um, resources in the back of Motor Girls, too. And, of course, that's, those are the kinds of resources that we've put in the Live Binder. When we think about women's history, one of the first things we think about are women's rights, women's right to vote. And, oh, my goodness, didn't that take forever to actually be real um, and to be able to vote? But one of the strongest voices of the women's rights movement and the right to vote was Alice Paul. And you will love this uh, new biography by Deborah Copps about Alice Paul and all those that she encouraged and she mentored. Um, you talk about somebody who did not sleep. This girl just worked and worked and worked. It is a longer biography, so it meets your, we need a a long biography to do this report, but it talks about all kinds of things that Alice was involved in, not just and when she finally got the vote, that wasn't just it. And I, I think maybe even I, for the first time, thought about by giving women the right to vote, a lot of the people who were involved in that decision were worried that, oh, if we let women vote, then they're probably going to want to have a job. And if they have a job, they're probably going to want to make as much as I do. That's what some of these men were thinking. And I thought, ah, oh, the light came on for me. And I thought, you know, I never even thought about that. Um, it wasn't just about we don't think women are smart enough to vote. It was infringing on their world. And I think you really get that when you read the voices in Alice Paul and the Fight for Women's Rights. There um, is a great book trailer, and I've put it on our YouTube book trailer channel. Um, so you can go to the playlist for book trailers for spring 2017, and you'll see that. And, of course, it's also in a live binder. There's an extensive back matter about Alice Paul and the rights for women and some of the other women who were participating in um, the demonstrations and the strikes and those that were jailed and the, the process that happened as a result of that, the laws that were changed. Um, so... She's absolutely somebody that we want to make sure our kids know about. And speaking of people and what they do, here's another idea for how we can celebrate women all year long. Uh, many of your databases, for example, FactSite, um, has a daily, here's what happened today, whichever year ago. You know, it's an um, annual event. And so you could check your, your encyclopedias or FactSite or other items like that and promote what women did on this day. So that might be another idea that you might try to celebrate Women's History Month all month.
The Library of Congress, of course, is one of my favorite, favorite resources. So many primary source documents there. And, of course, this month they have um, featured uh, women of protest, like women's suffrage and so on. But not just only that, but there's there are articles about diversity. There are articles about women getting jobs. Um, there are all kinds of resources that you could use from the Library of Congress, and they're free. So make sure you go there. So one of my favorite activities is um, reading a picture book. Like, for example, um, Brave Clara, which talks about um, Clara Limlick and how she, as a teenager, which your kids will love, um, as a teenager, she got all of New York to strike for the women's shirtwaist make, um, the women's shirtwaist makers factory, uh, because they were, you know, they were two bathrooms for 500 girls and people were working all night and they got charged when they broke a needle and all those kinds of things. And so she was that powerful voice. So you can go to the Library of Congress and you look and can see old newspapers. There's a great article about how she decided to be progressive and become a woman doctor, um, which your kids might find hilarious. But here's another idea that you might try as you're using those primary sources. Do a research challenge. So give them a picture you pull it from the Library of Congress and other resources like that and ask them, what do you see? Look at this picture and let's pull the knowledge that we already have before we just jump right into a research project. So, for example, on the slide that you see here, here we have a little girl and the, all the uh, um, notes that are in the dark color, the blue color, um, are what the kids said as they were looking at this picture. They said she has no safety equipment on. She um, doesn't have any shoes. Her clothes are baggy. She looks pale and tired and weary. Her The floor looks dirty. It doesn't seem like there's very much light in there and so on. And so um, you would follow it up with providing informational text. And so kids could read that and now they get proof based on what they looked at. Were they misled by this picture? Are there things that they got wrong? What are the things that they got right? And so kids can learn how to analyze pictures and primary sources as their research. As we're talking about feminism, here's a new book for high school called Here We Are. Um, we have this in our picture book category, uh, not picture book, paperback category. So this is a category, um, for those of you who are new to Junior Library Guild, we choose books and put them in categories based on their interest level or their genre. And one that we have for high school, all the books are paperback. And um, so this one has 44 contributors. There are artists, there are writers, there are people you know, there are people you don't know. And what they do are these short little articles, uh, poems, journaling, things like that, magazine articles. It's kind of scrapbook style um, where you see what feminism is, especially with all that's going on in the world today, like with the Women's March back in January. And um, yesterday there was a hashtag, um, now that it escapes me, a day without women, something like that, on International Women's Day. Um, but Lots of kids, or girls especially, may be asking, what is feminism? Am I a feminist? I don't even have any, I don't know. So they could read this book and read some of these articles and journal entries and, and so on and find out what is feminism. And one of the things I love about this compilation is it isn't just uh, full of women writers. There are also men having a voice about women, um, which I think is really good because one of the one of the reasons why we are having still women's rights issues is because all the voices aren't ours or aren't, aren't women's. And so it's time for us to think outside the box. And so I think um, this might be a good addition to your collection. Another one that I think absolutely for all of us who work with girls, we should be reading Girl Code. I'm just going to – that's my personal – opinion. But I think so many times when we, just like the girls who tell this story, this is actually, um, this is a book, Girl Code, Gaming, Going Viral, and Getting It Done. Um, it's written, um, co-written by Andrea Gonzalez and Sophie Hauser. And these are two girls who, for very different reasons, ended up in a girls coding summer camp. 
And one of the things that they learn um, and they talk about in this story as they go back and forth is that we have this misconception about who is a coder. And you have to be a math person or you have to be a guy or you have to be somebody that looks like they should be on Big Bang. And so what they learn as they try coding is you don't have to be a math expert. You have to know some math, but you really just have to be a problem solver. And so through this chance encounter, they learn about coding. They build a game. Their game their game is called Tampon Run. It goes viral. And now they've done TED Talk, and they're doing a tour for the book. Um, there's coding bonus in the back of the book, but it's so important for girls to understand that you can be whoever you want to be. Um, you don't have to be a nurse or a teacher or a librarian. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we want girls to not see the glass ceiling anymore. We want them to know that they're okay and that they have a superpower. What is your superpower? And it also talks about the importance of having a mentor. And so those of us who are women, we should be looking for chances to mentor girls to help them know that they're okay and they have a superpower. Another thing that I love about this book is that there is some really strong cooperation among girls. And we've seen plenty of mean girl stuff going on um, as kids get older and there's ostracism and there's bullying and there's you don't dress like me. Uh, but with this coding, they become a team and they want each other to succeed. And I think that's another skill, I think, that we need to pass on to the girls that we work with. Here's another way that you can be involved with girl books and feminism and women who rock all year long. There is the Amelia Bloomer Project. Since 2012, they've been recommending feminist literature for birth through 18 years. And so the nominations are open for the 2018 Amelia Bloomer Project. So you and your girls and boys can nominate books that you think fit this project. And so you can also, of course, use the list that they make as your shopping list. Um, you'll find many JLG selections on there as well. Um, but check out that link that you'll see on your handout and nominate some books. And you can do it all year long. And that way we're continuing to keep women in our focus. Another resource that I want you to know about is Time for Kids. And Time for Kids has some Women's History Month printables. And so here you can be the rock star for your teachers who are working on this because it's already done. And so you can go in there, and um, especially if you're elementary um, or work with elementary age kids, you can have these printables ready. Um, maybe you have kids who are coming into your library, whether you're elementary uh, a school library or you're a public library, you could have some of these ready so that as kids are doing research, they can jump right on there and fill these out. Um, it'll help them with their note-taking and researching skills too. Another thing that you could do with your patrons or students is integrate technology. So there's a we've all seen memes, right? So there's another side of memes called an info pic. And the info pic takes a picture and puts, of course, information with it. So here, for example, is Kate DiCamillo. You know, we all know and love her. And so last year I was at a breakfast and I heard her say, stories give kids the language to talk about things that matter. And I went, oh, that's an info pic. And so I quick took a picture of her with my phone and used Typerama, which is an app, and loaded the picture in, typed in the words, and it created this for me. And so within 30 seconds, no more than a minute, boom, I had a shareable info pic that I could put on Twitter. Um, so you can use this any number of ways. You can either use an original photo, or if you're having kids do reperson, they can upload a photo that they find out there in the world. The um, Both... Um, well, not both, all, Typorama or Adobe Spark, which are apps for iPhones, and PicMonkey, which is a website, 
they all have Creative Commons photos. So you could just you could even get one from them and then put in the content that your kids have done the research on. And so they can put a fact there, they can put a quote there, you can rotate these out, you can print them out, you can embed them in your blog post or on your websites. Um, they're savable. Um, and all those all three of those are free. So make sure you give those a try. Then we think about displays. The displays, of course, are a great way to get kids to read books. You know, they don't read the books and don't check them out from the top shelf or the bottom shelf. In fact, in San Diego, we used to have, remember, we had bottom shelf checkout day because kids don't choose from the bottom shelf. They like to choose from the cover like a bookstore. So as you are doing displays, you could do a Google search. And I just did a Google image search on Women's History Month library displays. You could do the same one on Pinterest, but you can get some ideas about how you can display your books. But make sure as you're doing displays, think about, is it diverse? Am I including women? Et cetera. As you're looking for more resources, um, I ran into, bless his heart, James Bryan, who is um, in South Carolina, and he does amazing things to help the librarians in South Carolina. But he um, graciously allowed me to share his Women's Hist History Month document, which is a multi-page document that has websites, it has a book list, it has um, even women movies on it. And so when you click on the link in your handout, um, so you want to make sure you have it digitally, you can either get it from the platform you're using right now, um, look in the resources, or you can go to the Junior Library Guild website after this webcast and click on the um, webcast recap and you'll see the link there. Um, but use this to help you as you go through the year and support women and the women who rock. So today we have talked about some amazing women. We've talked about some new programming that you might try. So look at your collection while you're thinking about it. Do you have women? In fact, did you just see this week the there was a an independent bookstore in Cleveland, Ohio, and they turned all the books around that weren't written by women, and there were very few left. So make sure you're buying books by and about women, um, the illustrators, the um, the writers. Um, I also saw an article, um, a little video clip, and I know some of you have already seen it, where we, the mom and her daughter pulled out the books that had um, all the princess books, all the books where the, the girl doesn't talk, all the books that don't have girls in them at all, and there was just this tiny little bit left. Um, so we need to make sure that we are supporting women and females. Um, look at the new resources that I've given you today. Think about adding STEAM to your library program. Think about an hour of code and encouraging your girls to be part of that. And let us know what you do to celebrate women all year long. Yes, and in addition to telling you about these great books, remember we also create resources to help you use these books. You'll find resources for today's and other selections in our new JLG BTG Spring 2017 Live Binder. And be sure to look for today's and other resources on our Pinterest boards. We have one called Women Who Rocked the World, and you'll see today's resources and others on that board. Follow us at Junior Library Guild. And check out our website, juniorlibraryguild.com, after the webcast for the recap blog post. You'll find a list of all the books with links to their book detail pages and other resources. And remember to look on those book detail pages for a link to the LiveBinder resources so you'll find everything you need right on our website. Join us next time on March 21st at 3 o'clock Eastern when Carl Harvey, an instructor of school librarianship at Longwood University and past president of AASL, will join me in getting to know the spring's hottest debut K-12 authors and illustrators. We'll talk about the new class of 2017 and their amazing first titles. In fact, Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give, has already gotten six stars and debuted New York Times number one for YA. So get a head start and read The Hate You Give. And if not, we'll talk about it next one, next month, or in two weeks. This K-12 webcast is great for everybody. Well, thanks again to Deborah for sharing practical strategies, free resources, and inspiring books.
And thanks to you, our listeners, for supporting these authors and illustrators with your time. Be sure to ask your account rep about all our books and categories. You can contact our sales department for more information. Tomorrow, you'll receive an automatic email regarding today's webinar, and if you follow the link, you can watch the archived webinar and print your certificate of attendance after 10 minutes of viewing. Please stick around for a brief survey, and until next time, thanks again for joining us. Happy reading.